Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you doing, sir? Well, surviving. Okay. I guess. All right. Just, can you kindly introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Dr. Nongoteso. I'm a resident in internal medicine. Okay. So please, where did you have your undergraduate training? Um, Harkiv National Medical University in Ukraine. Harkiv, okay. Ukraine. All right. So what about your housemanship? My housemanship was in... Or was that? Sorry. Benin State University Chino Hospital. Okay. Um, Makodi Benin State. Okay. And currently you're doing residency? In the University of Abuja Chino Hospital, Gogolada. All right, Abuja. sir. Thank you very much. All right, so sir, how has residency training been? Is it what you expected? Okay, um, I would say for the large part is what I expected, but given the peculiarities of my center that I'm at presently, I think the patient load <laughs> was a surprise when you're in some units. But apart from that, every other thing was pretty much expected. Because during the, my house job training already, I just did my mindset towards the way the management system works. So I would say for the most part is what I expected. How much do you earn as a registrar currently? Okay, for this question, let's just pay it out. <laughs> Area thousand plus. Okay, okay. And during your residency so far, have you had to make a critical decision under pressure and how did you handle it? Okay, um, so in one instance, when you had a patient who was immediately diagnosed diabetic and then was having cellulitis at the time, um, we were managing and it wasn't improving and even had depressed consciousness. So at the point, we saw that it was no more um, cellulitis, it was more of a necrotizing for shitis, and then we had to schedule for amputation, but the relatives refused. So practically, we had to cancel and cancel and cancel, and then we just had to take measures to keep the patient alive Why they made the decision. Their own stance was that the patient comes and makes the decision by himself. But we, our argument was like this patient's consciousness has already been altered and cannot make a decision for himself. So why the wife, <coughs> who's probably the next of kin at the time, won't make that decision for him? So generally, we were monitoring the patient continuously until we went to the ICU. We had to, based on the um, vasopressor cell dopamine, had to switch to adrenaline. At the end of the day, it was unfortunate that we did lose the patient. So it's uh, one of those trying times in the profession. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm aware that some calls in the emergency can be crazy, particularly, of course, at night. Is there any particular night you remember during your residency that was terrible? And how did you handle it? How did you pull through? Okay. For us now, our emergency is even bigger. It's like a total of um, 34 beds now. So I think in the night I can remember, we had about 16 patients. And most, most of the patients came later in the day from 4 and beyond. So although that night, my senior issue was around throughout and she really helped. But documenting for about 8 to 9 patients that we go, it was not really easy, so I was um, blacking out and coming back. So I had to just leave and sleep for, I think, slept for like from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. and came back. So some nights can be like that, um, really tiring, and then simple decisions that you normally make, you cannot even get to make them clearly or even spell clearly. So maybe sometimes you just need to take an hour or two to just try and rest a bit and come back. So that's how I usually try to handle the bulk, even there's a bulk of patients to review. Now, what success stories stands out for you in terms of urgent intervention for a patient that would have otherwise died without that intervention? Uh, okay. So recent, we had this patient that um, we got the consult for, and the consult said that the patient had the respiratory tract infection. But on review, I think subsequently, when we reviewed first, we maintained the diagnosis, but subsequent review, um, as she was getting breathless off oxygen. So I was going to review, we saw that the there was a mismatch between the limbs. So the right limb now, right and um, left limb, sorry, was bigger than the right. So we had the measurement done and it was a significant difference. So we had to do a doppler and we saw that it was there was DVT. So obviously it changed our minds so was thinking of the pulmonary embolism. Then we started on uh, anticoagulants that really helped the patient. The patient has been discharged now. Have you encountered a medical case during residency that baffled you and maybe the entire team? And what was the ultimate resolution in that instance? Sometimes we watch movies, we mm. see residents, even the attendants overseas now brainstorming and trying to really clinch on a diagnosis. How does that play out in your setting when there is a diagnosis that has been difficult? Yeah, when there's a dilemma. Okay. So <clears throat> this wasn't like a, maybe it was a dilemma, I don't know. 
but it was an elderly man that came to clinic. I think you were aware of this, maybe I didn't come at the time to our unit. Um, patient came and non hypertensive, non diabetic, was on medication. Came that he was very tired and that, okay, we should just admit him. And he suggested the admission at first. So they were just to admit him, rehydrate properly, check glucose, and investigate further. Just do the workup, cardiologic workup. And then to get the cardiologist to review as well. So the diagnosis at the time was just taking into consideration his um, tiredness, excessive tiredness, or maybe lethargy at the time. So we just admitted for that. And the cardiologist came to review because he goes to the cardiology clinic. So he's a patient that they are aware of. He came to review as well and just placed on ensure his medication. And then unfortunately, later in the night, he lost the patient, the patient that was otherwise stable. So I think in that aspect, we because we don't have a lot of um, post-mortems done. That would have been a patient that, because he looks stable, he gave his history by himself. On review, he still gave the histories by himself. Mm. There was, apart from the excessive tiredness, there was nothing else mm-hmm. that was wrong. Mm-hmm. And cardiologist came and revealed as well, but later in the night, we didn't get the clear picture of what exactly happened, but it's all passed. So in, hand, in hindsight, sorry, having a post-mortem for that kind of patient will improve our knowledge. But really, because the consultant saw, I reviewed the clinic and then the consultant cardiologist also saw. And nothing could have been, nothing was picked. I needed urgent attention at the time. So sometimes, I guess it happens like that. It's just strange. Mm. So I think that would be a case that was quite troubling. How do you manage the demanding schedule of residency while ensuring a healthy work life balance? For you in particular, now you look fit, it's like you go to the gym, exercise. Okay. I know that. So how do you balance our exercise? Maybe it's just genetics, but um, I can't. I um I, I can't really go to the gym anymore like I used to. I used to before when I was in the school. But at least you can do home workouts before you take your shower. In, in the day, because the residency will take away most of your life. So for me, sometimes you just have to take out time for yourself and be. Um, like say stingy about it or yeah. self-centered. Let me use the better word, self-centered. That some just take some hours to at least take care of yourself and refresh. Because if something happens now, someone's going to replace you in your unit or in you your did. spot. So someone's going to be shifted to take care, take care of the patients while you're not there. So at least you need to give time to yourself as well. Because <clears throat> you too, as a doctor, you can also be a patient as well. So you need to give some time to at least. Re- it's difficult to rest. But now, for me, sleep has become <laughs> sleep has become more vital during the training period. I think sleep even over food sometimes, <laughs> some nights. So sleep is important. If not, you can't really function, function. the next day. Yeah. It's hard to create, create a balance, but at some point you find what works for you. From your perspective as a resident, what emerging technologies or medical advancements will have the most significant impact, particularly in our setting? Okay for our setting okay for the for our center here i would say um if we had more ultrasound guidance for a lot of things or if we get handheld ultrasound devices and training to use them because sometimes even for lines for example we need some guidance for some difficult patients and then we do calculations we do bind calculations sometimes so central uh, venous access as well we do it blind this time so that could help um improve patient's um, outcome and then the delays that we have in getting IV access sometimes. And then on a larger picture, maybe availability of imaging. Sometimes there's no imaging studies to help in this patient's management. And if we can even have it closer, maybe in the accident and emergency surgical and medical and mm-hmm. ONG as well, that's obstetric and gynecology. We can have those imagings in-house in the emergency. You can make the diagnosis there and start appropriate uh, management immediately. So we have that challenge of sometimes sending patients outside. What advice do you have for aspiring medical professionals entering residency? I have this particularly because we know the Japa wave is on now. So some persons might not be sure. Mm. Should they stay back? Should they just put all their thoughts into leaving the country? What's your counsel for someone maybe finishing house job, finishing youth service regarding residency? Well, well, it depends. If you have a plan to, to continue residency, you if you don't have if you're still here and maybe you have not written your exams, my advice is you could start and at least gain more get more experience while you do your process. For me, staying back was 
um, wanting to help my people more, like learning more, advancing in your own field, and then helping the people in your locality, your relatives. They always call. They've heard that you're a doctor now. They always call. Yeah. But if you already have plans and motion to leave, no, I will never advise anybody not to leave because maybe there you might still be a residency or whichever pathway you want to follow. But if you're here and there's some delays, why not just start something yeah. and then gain the experience that will definitely help you when you get over there. But if you have plans of not living as well, residence is a good pathway because at least mm -hmm. there's a structure and there's a training and then you're getting to the top of that particular field that you have chosen. So it works both ways. But I won't advise anybody not to go if you want to go, if that's really what you want to do. So for that young chap out there, who wants to come into medical school mm -hmm. or who has his or mind fixed on internal medicine? Do you have any final advice or parting words? Well, for someone who wants to come into medicine, internal medicine, let's see. Well, I, it's quite, <laughs> workload is bulky, the areas to cover a lot. So, but it's a great field to choose in that medicine, let's see, because everybody needs your input at a certain point in time for their management and other things as well. So, and it's part of the surgical part of things is all encompassing, touches almost everywhere. So if, for me now, in having gone to medical school and seeing how the condition is for doctors here and maybe elsewhere, I just feel like you have to have the conviction within you that this is what you want to do. There are a lot of things that you could do that will give you more money. But if you have a conviction that this is, you have a connection to helping people, most importantly, and then going for their saving lives, then I think internal medicine is that field for you. Because you have covered a lot of cases, a lot of cases, and you have knowledge in a lot of aspects. And also, being in the program, you have challenges, you can always ask just enough. So, it's a good, internal medicine is still a good avenue to reaching your professional goals. Thank you very much, sir. It's been great doing this interview with you. We'll hopefully see you next time. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.